My name is Anthony Wa. I am a UK and US trained Anderson consultant. Today I'd like to go through how I would conduct a video consultation for a patient presenting with nasal obstruction, which I hope will be of use to general practitioners as well as my less experienced colleagues in this specialty. Uh, before I delve into specifics, I'd like to go through the normal functions of the nose, uh, which includes the following. Um, it serves as a conduit of uh, air passing to the lungs, um, during which the nose also helps to filter uh, particles from the nose so it doesn't get into the lungs. And this is usually gotten rid of by uh, the sneezing action, usually facilitated by the mucociliary transport mechanism, which serves to shift things either towards the front and out where sneezing, or pushes things down uh, where it's either swallowed, coughed out, or less elegantly, spat out. Apart from this filtering mechanism, the line of the nose also helps to warm and humidify the air that gets along, as cold dry air is very irritant to the airway. There are smell particles around the roof of the nose which help us perceive things and also has a modulatory function on taste. The nose also serves as a means of allowing the middle ear to keep the pressures the same as the outside through the eustachian tube. So it's very important that this is maintained um, in order to facilitate the transfer of sound from the outside through the middle ear and to the inner ear where it's converted to electrical signals which your brain understands. And if the pressure is not adequate, then this would be impaired. Now, the nose is surrounded by various structures, including the eyes, um, the skull brace around the top, and that also houses the brain, and the floor of the nose is generally the, uh, the roof of the mouth. And these structures may well present as pathologies within the nose causing this obstruction. The nose also consists of skin, subcutaneous tissue, muscles, there's bone and cartilage, and the line of the nose, which also contains erectile tissue, which um, enlarges and shrinks in response to temperature changes and other circumstances within the nose. Now, all this can be affected by various pathology, which include um, trauma from outside, disease processes, which also include inflammation and infection may take the form of either allergies or um, infection. Um, there are congenital abnormalities that affect the nose that may present with nasal obstruction and also bear in mind that masses may well be inside the nose or uh, from outside extending to the inside and this may well have a bearing on your assessment of these patients. Now in terms of a video consultation it's very important that you get a very good history whilst observing the patient and you may well during the observation phase ask them to do specific things that will facilitate your diagnosis given that you're no longer able to examine them directly um, especially when there are extreme increased patient safety concerns uh, as well as practitioner safety due to airborne disease in terms of the history uh, difficulty in breathing through a nose nasal obstruction you want to assess whether this is due to uh, a persistent feature. If it's persistent, that would suggest that there's a structural uh, problem which may well be need to be addressed surgically. If it's intermittent, especially if it goes from side to side, it might be an exaggeration of the normal. Um, and this may well only require medical treatment. Um, but it doesn't preclude the fact that there might be a structural problem that is making the uh, symptoms worse. Patients with blocked nose would also complain of uh, dryness of the throat. Uh, they may well present with a, a tendency to breathe through their mouth. Uh, because of the back pressure on the sinuses, either due to blockage or due to acclimated fluid which gets infected, they may well complain of frontal headaches, peripheral discomfort, um, and these, in a with nasal obstruction, would make you think of a primary nasal complaint. However, isolated headaches uh, without nasal symptoms is very unlikely to be due to either nose or sinus disease. Because the uh, nose has sensory and vascular input, there may well be facial sensory changes. Um, I think of disease might well affect the uh, greater palatine nerves or other nerves around there, which may present with uh, facial pain or facial numbness. 
I need to be at this in mind doing assessment of a patient with nasal obstruction. Um, they very well complain of snoring uh, and as well as other sleep disorders. Daytime sleepiness and being uh, unrefreshed after sleep may well be because that nose is blocked and may well give you an indication of the severity. Uh, loss of smell and auto taste. Uh, you find that even when you have a cold, you also have these symptoms, and that's because particles are no longer getting to the areas where sense uh, or smell is. And, and that will help give you an assessment of the kind of problems the patient may well be having. If you have lots of retained secretions within the nose, um, and this gets affected, or sometimes it's just there for quite a while, the patient may well have a bad breath or may complain of uh, feeling that everyone else smells something adverse going on. Loosening of the teeth may well be due to dental problems uh, in isolation, but it could be a manifestation of serious uh, nasal complaints and worthwhile making a note of that. Um, patients with a blocked nose with post -nose discharge may well be harboring polyps or any other nasal tumours. So it's something to bear in mind when you're assessing the patients uh, who complain of um, the post-nose drip, but this may well be a feature of rhinitis. If a patient has salty tasting fluid, you have to bear in mind that the score base uh, also houses cerebral spinal fluid, CSF, and this has a salty taste. And if they have copious amounts, it may be something you want to bear in mind while you're assessing the patients. Patients with nose blockage, especially young adults, young male adults, uh, and uh, if you have that in association with bleeding, you have to bear in mind that these patients may well have uh, juvenile nasopharyngeal uh, lesion, so that's an angiofibroma, fibroma, and this may well need to be addressed. In addition to uh, these patients, you also have to bear in mind uh, patients of uh, Chinese descent and others who may well have a nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So you want to make sure that uh, an assessment of um, questions relating to the cranial nerve function are also addressed, and that may well give an idea of what you need to do with these patients. Um, especially in terms of uh, allergic rhinitis, since it's fairly common, um, you want to get a history whether there's any seasonal or down ovulation. In other words, does it happen during a particular time of the year uh, or does it happen during a particular time of the day? For example, if the symptoms are worse at night, it may well be a manifestation of house dust mite allergies. Um, if it happens in the building site, maybe reacting to certain, certain things that are released in the building, the patient may well be um, reacting to. Um, a history of rhinorrhea, including personal drip, uh, may well be elicited from patients with allergic rhinitis. Uh, bear in mind if they have nasal orbital, nasal orbital and pharyngeal itching uh, and sneezing, this may well clinch a diagnosis of allergic rhinitis and you'll be able to institute treatment based on that. These patients may also present with uh, watery eyes, which may be red, and this may well further uh, guide your management of these patients. If a patient complains of crusting in the nose, you also bear in mind that the nose may well be a site of uh, autoinflammatory disease or autoantibodies may well be persistent and you need to include diseases like lupus, uh, vaginus, glomatosis, and even tuberculosis in the nose, in, especially in the endemic areas. If they have a sort of dryness of the eyes and mouth, you want to think of uh, the Sicker syndrome and may well guide your further investigations in that line. A patient with unilateral dis mucosa discharge, if it's a charge, or someone with learning difficulties, you have to think of someone that's not a foreign body nose. But having said that, there may well be a sign that there is a tumor lodged inside the nose, and you need, need to attend to that um, fairly urgently. Um, making note of things that may make the symptoms worse, like some patients, uh, if they're exposed to flowers, they may sneeze a lot. I've had patients that reacted to air fresheners. So you, it's also worthwhile finding out from them what they've noticed to, uh, that is an environment that brings on these symptoms. I alluded to hair loss. Um, if the nose is blocked and you do have a fair amount of um, uh, uh, hair loss or fluctuating hair loss, it may well be because of the nasal obstruction that they have. These patients may also have air aches and autophony. Uh, history of trauma to the nose. Uh, boxers tend to have a flattened nose. A depressed nose bridge may be a manifestation of uh, a condition such as tuberculosis or even lupus, where the nasal structure itself is destroyed. Uh, a history of visceral disturbance. 
um, a history of trauma, uh, either professionally, as in boxers or rugby players, or uh, in terms of uh, assault, may well explain a depressed nasal bridge. But this could also happen in relation to diseases or tuberculosis, vagueness, granulomatosis, uh, patients uh, that had uh, sickle cell disease where the structure of the bone may be damaged. Um, patients with lupus, especially if they have the typical malar rash distribution, may well clinch your diagnosis as a cause of the nasal obstruction. Patients with syphilis uh, has that along with other uh, facial features which may help you in assessing the patients. Um, in terms of visual disturbance, it can be a wide variety of things such as blurred vision, double vision, uh, or just no vision at all, as well as the primary problem within the nose. Um, in terms of medical history, patients on hypertensive agents, or antihypertensive agents rather, may well have medications such as uh, beta blockers, which can cause nasal congestion. ACE inhibitors also may cause nasal congestion, so you need to bear that in mind. Patients with low thyroid levels, uh, mixed edema, may well present with nasal obstruction, and these are things that you probably want to establish with other things in the history. Uh, there is a strong history of atopy in the family in patients with allergic rhinitis. If both parents have it, there's a 30% chance that the offspring would have allergic rhinitis, and you need to bear this in mind your history taking, history of smoking, history of working with softwood, as in carpenters or covers. And these patients are prone to having, uh, these occupations are prone to having adenocarcinoma of the ethmoids. So you need to bear that in mind when you're assessing them uh, remotely. Builders also, um, patients that work in the garden fields all the time, they will have symptoms aggravated when they go to work. In your visual assessment, you want to look at the structure of the nose to see if there's an obvious nasal deformity, already alluded to the cell nose sudden nose deformity. Polyps may broaden the nose and generally speaking the nose bridge should be about the width of uh, an eye. So if there's a wide disparity then you know that there might be something amiss. Uh, facial swelling, um, even in patients with sinusitis, or, or they may well have uh, orbital involvement causing the distortion of the face. Uh, patients with tumors may also have a distorted uh, nose and face. There might be a visible tumour, or you might even be able to see a foreign body within the nose if you ask them to adopt slightly. The breathing may be noisy. Um, one way of assessing nasal obstruction is putting a metal uh, plate, like a, a knife, a blunt knife, obviously, or a glass light, and seeing how much misting is formed on them. And that gives you an idea of the airflow. In, child, in, in young children uh, using cotton wool, and using it to see if it air moves may well give you a rough idea of how uh, well the uh, child is breathing. A cotter test involves us lifting up the nose bridge. So you can ask the patient to lift on the nose and see if the breathing is much better. Uh, obviously in septal deviation, if you are able to get more air coming through the nose when you lift up the nose in that manner, that would give an indication of a septal deviation. Um, flaring of the out of the nose the, like that, it will suggest that there's some difficulty in breathing. Uh, nasal collapse, so after you ask them to sniff, and you see the nose collapsing inwards, may well suggest that there is some difficulty with breathing. Uh, if there's creasing of the super tip around the bridge of the nose, we tell you if the patient's been rubbing their nose a lot. Um, sometimes it may be quite red around that area. We suggest that the patient blows their nose a lot and has to, to use a tissue on a frequent basis. Uh, Mellow rash, suggestive of lupus. Uh, skin options are something that you need to take on board when you're assessing these patients. Some patients may well have a nasal drip without you realizing it, especially some patients with a CSF leak. Um, you want to look out for cranial nerve amyloses, particularly those involved in movement of the eyes, uh, three, four, and six cranial nerves. Uh, optic nerve, uh, if there's a lesion affecting it, can cause blindness. You need to bear that in mind. So generally speaking, if they can't move the eyes or if it's painful when they move the eyes, you want to suspect that the nasal obstructions are associated with something that's causing problems outside of the nose. Redness of the eyes can be a sign of inflammation, as in conjunctivitis. Watery eyes may well be a sign of allergy. It could also be a sign that the nasal lacrimal duct from the eyes to the nose is blocked. Um, display of the eyes is something to bear in mind as well. Various investments are necessary, uh, and what is based on what your uh, history 
and visual assessment is able to determine. Uh, you can always request for a blood test for allergies. If it's convenient, you can do a, you know, get someone to do a skin test. The radar pool image that I find most useful is a CT scan of the sinuses, which gives most information. The only disadvantage is the amount of radiation that uh, is generated. Uh, sinus x-ray doesn't give much information. Um, and an MRI scan is only useful, uh, in my view, in terms of malignant lesions, if you want to assess soft tissue. But it tends to exaggerate uh, sinus disease, hence it's reduced um, use or, uh, or in assessing patients with sinus infections. Blood tests are also uh, dependent on what you find. Uh, more often than not, uh, other than ESL, um, they usually have a very low yield. Uh, well, I hope in these few uh, things, you may find it uh, helpful in assessing patients. And this may decide uh, your subsequent management with of these patients. Um, and um, if, if there are any further questions, you can always get through to me either uh, via email, ENT uh, at tenua.com, or you can check for more information on my website, www.tenua.com. And uh, glad to make acquaintance. Bye for now.